Monica Lennon. Thank you, Kavita. Good morning, everyone. Just to um, pick up on a point that, that Liam Kerr just raised, um, on the requirement to submit workforce projections, um, I'm quite interested in the report that the reference that's been made to two of the NH boards, um, Ayrshire and Arran and, and Lanarkshire, which is my local board. And I see that they've only projected their workforce for one year rather than the, the required three. Now, I think there's been some explanation given as the reason for that, but I wonder if you could comment on that further and uh, what are the risks of them only, you know, what, what are the, the risks that could arise or um, the, the repercussions of only providing that one year projection? Richard, can you help us with that one? So I think if we look back, one of the things we did as well as looking forward is looking back to what that means for what workforce they have versus what they um, what they use. So um, I think on that first point, what we're saying is that they are um, traditionally spending more than that. And one of the points we make is that there could be a link there or a reason there behind why some boards are overspending against their pay budgets. Because is this about their information about what they know for the future? And obviously their um, projections are going to link to what their costs are going to be. Um, I also think on, a, um, on, on a, uh, a, a larger level, on a regional than a, a national level, is that if there is going to be better sort of lines of responsibility and closer working between them to work out what their medium and long-term needs are in, in um, the workforce, it's important that um, the Scottish Government of the regions are assured that the projections that they're getting from NHS boards are realistic and reasonable. because. The, what we'd like to see is that those are the basis upon which they're making decisions around training, around skills mix, about how to use the workforce within a uh, reformed NHS. Okay. So in a situation where a health board is only doing a one-year projection, um, does the Scottish Government have to give um, a special permission for that or does the health board have discretion? So I'm not sure on, on the details okay. of that question, if I'm honest. Um, I know that um, that some chose to, and the reasons they were given it was because they were undergoing reform, so it wasn't realistic for them to make those projections in their views. Now, um, I'm not sure as to how that fits in a kind of in the requirement side of things. Okay, thank you. Um, elsewhere in your report, I think it's um, paragraph 50. And I can understand why you say you're talking about the risk that could arise from the sheer number of workforce plans and the number of different workforce groups um, that could become a barrier to effective working. Um, I can see the potential for that being quite a cluttered sort of working area. Um, I don't think you've made any particular recommendations um, along with your observations. I just wondered um, what you think could be done to mitigate that risk of, of that clutter? Um, you know, is there an overabundance of workforce plans and groups? I think the relevant recommendation in the report is the one about clarifying the responsibilities for workforce planning. Um, and in some ways, it goes back to Mr. Kerr's question earlier um, that uh, all of the, these people have got a role to play, but it's important they understand what that role is and how the plans come together. They build up to the national picture, the regional picture, the, the very local picture, even within health boards. Um, that's confused at the moment. We say in the report there's a risk it becomes more confused with the new integration authorities also thinking about the workforce they need and the new elective centres that are being established across Scotland. Um, and in many ways, I think that's um, part of the answer to actually seeing progress and action in this area, um, that at the moment an awful lot of effort is going into developing plans and not enough into understanding and, and filling in the gaps in the data and then using it to genuinely look ahead at what um, skills, what professional groupings we'll need and what that means for the training that's starting now and in the immediate period ahead. So what simple things can be done to avoid that sort of fragmentation where people are all working separately but we're not getting that holistic overview? And responsibilities is the big thing. Richard, what, were you, what, what do you add to that? So, um, agreeing with that really, but um, obviously within the um, National Workforce Plan Part 1, um, the, uh, there will be a National Workforce Planning Group, which will be formed to look at some of these strategic decisions um, and decide what level of um, planning should be done at what level. So, for example, at 
regional workforce plans may appear like a more strategic document. It, it might set up different things like what is the overall skill set of the workforce that exists within that region and how best that can be used. Um, the other thing I think is about the, the National Workforce Forum, which will be about supporting these various parts and seeing how they fit together. So some of this will be around responsibility and around clarity of lines. So looking at um, how your integration, the, the first lot of integration um, authority plans came out this year. Um, so how are these going to fit into what's within an NHS board plan and what's in a regional plan? I think there's work to be done there um, um, and uh, decisions to be made. And so just to reiterate the point, I think it's about being organised and, and making sure that there's clear responsibility in what workforce plan will have what in it. No, I, I take the point about that need for um, clarity over responsibility. I suppose I'm wondering who is responsible for making sure that, that that happens? I think the Scottish Government is responsible for clarifying the roles in the system as a whole. Um, they, they do lead the system. Um, beneath that, the, the individual challenges and problems will be different in different parts of Scotland. We've touched on the challenges in rural Scotland. The report talks about um, shortages in some particular medical specialties. Um, I think once it's clear who's responsible for what, it's much easier to get in, analyse the data and make sure you know what the problems are in your part of Scotland and then be clear who can take the, the action that's needed to um, to resolve that. Um, if it's about having more doctors going into training, that's something that can only be done by the government. If it's about making the local bank for nurses um, more flexible, more responsive to individual nurses' needs, um, more of a place where people feel an allegiance, that's very much down to local leadership, and there'll be solutions all the way sort of up and down the chain, depending on the particular problem you're trying to solve. OK. Um, one of the things that I struggle to understand is that, you know, we're told often that staffing levels in the NHS are at their, their highest ever level. You know, if that is the case, why is it that the workforce is still struggling to cope with demand? A big part of that is the fact that we've got an ageing population and within the larger number of older people, people tend to have more complex health conditions, chronic conditions that last for a long time. Several things um, wrong with them at the same time. The, the multiple comorbidities is a horrible phrase the professionals use, but we can all recognise it in our own parents and, and relatives. Um, and that means that, that the number of people needed to deliver the health service keeps on increasing as the amount of money um, that we're spending on the health service does, um, and it's still struggling to keep up with the demand. There are solutions to that in thinking about new ways of working. The integration authorities are intended to be a key part of that, but they will only be able to have an impact if they've got the right staff in the right place to work in new ways that will help to keep people safe at home for longer, for example, or to get them discharged more quickly and safely after they have had to go into hospital and, and we're seeing slow progress on that part of the mix. Mm -hmm. Reflecting on what we've already heard today, would it be correct to conclude that the Scottish Government have failed to adequately plan for the right mix rather than just the, the numbers alone of skilled staff? Yes, I think our conclusion about the inadequacy of the current planning would cover both the, the, the range of skills and the range of professionals needed as well as straightforwardly the numbers. Um, I think the government itself has recognised that the answer to the challenges facing the health service isn't simply to keep on growing the number of staff. It's about people working differently in different roles and different teams in future. And that obviously increases the premium on getting workforce planning right. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that there's been a failure to adequately plan for the right mix of skills that the NHS needs? Yes, if I can point you at the report itself, I think we say very clearly um, at the, the beginning of key message two that so far the um, workforce planning hasn't been effective um, and the reason for the report and the tone of it is because that's obviously key to the health service being able to meet the needs of people right across Scotland in the years ahead. Okay, thank you. Are you satisfied that the plans currently in place by the Scottish Government to produce a three-stage workforce plan over the next year will be sufficient to address these problems? I, I think we think the overall approach is a sound one. Um, as members across the committee have hinted, um, there is a lot still to do and the, the past track record um, hasn't been encouraging. So we're, we're watching progress closely and I'm sure the committee will want to explore that um, with uh, colleagues from the Scottish Government. And I'm, I'm looking at exhibit two, the workforce pressures in the NHS. And with, with that in mind, some of the, the staff survey statistics there, what 
will the con consequences be if this workforce plan doesn't meet up to expectations on demand? So we're setting out some trends there, um, and and um, you know, I suppose if we look at things like um, how. Uh, how staff feel about working in the NHS. We want that to be as positive as possible as does everyone else. I suppose on the specific levels, uh, we highlight in part three of the report some of the um, uh, potential scenarios or projections that could happen if um, some of the issues with um, the nursing workforce aren't dealt with over the next few years and how that could affect things like vacancies. Um, obviously, as this report demonstrates in the conversations have today, a lot of these things are linked between vacancies and use of agency and morale of staff. Um, so these are some of the potential um, reasons why these pressures are important, and which is why we think workforce planning and the improvement of it is, a, is something that's urgently, urgently needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the one that jumps out for me from the 2015 staff survey is that um, only one third of staff feel that there are enough staff for them to do their job properly, and I think that that is quite concerning. I think others have briefly touched on allied health professionals, um, so I wanted to 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 pick that up. Um, I'm interested in the the fact that it's it's not the government who says the the numbers of of university places for AHPs. Is that something that you think has to change? It is something that in the national workforce. Plan part one, the Scottish Government has said that they're going to explore. Um, AHPs is a, um, an umbrella term for a number of different um, smaller groups. Um, and so as, as such, as far as controlling the numbers in a way that you may be able to within a, a larger nursing workforce or a medical, the, the, the challenges would be diff different. And also, um, AHPs work a lot across NHS and social care, so some will work within local governments, for example. So so there are some complications, um, I suppose, to a, to a straightforward um, control number. It is something that the Scottish Government are going to look into. I think what we're, uh, what we're, what we're making clear in, in, the, in the report is that the AHPs have a role within that skills mix, and we highlight some uh, areas such as um, radiography. Um, but there's also shortages within certain areas of the AHP workforce. So really it's for the Scottish Government to consider, alongside that future demand, what's the best skills mix to address that, and then to ensure that they're getting the right numbers through the system, however that is decided. OK, thank you. If you know, we're expecting the next five to ten years that the, the nursing and, and doctor workforce will begin to grow, what impact will that have on AHPs? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that okay. question, I'm afraid. I guess I, I suppose I'm wondering if we're moving towards a community-based model of care and we've got more doctors and nurses available to make referrals if we're not keeping up in terms of the supply of AHPs and what does that mean for, for patient care? Sorry, um, yes, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so I understand that. Sorry about that. So uh, I think um, one of the points that we're making in the report is about recruitment and how uh, it's sometimes a bit linear as far as what's what's done in terms of medical and, and nursing and AHPs. And I think that fits here because I, th I think that question is around um, multidisciplinary working and how these skills groups are going to come together. And if the numbers of one increases, what happens to the effect of the other? I think if the decision-making process and some of the recruitment decisions don't have that joined-up view around considering that skills mix, I think that that is a, that is a risk. Um, which is, I think is why it's important, as well as looking at demand, to consider how different groups of people are going to work together in the future. I mean, given the challenges that we've already heard, and you know, you've, you've referenced the fact that EHPs are a number of different professional organisations here. How realistic is it that we can get to a point where, you know, we can have this holistic approach um, that, that captures all of that? Is it just too difficult? In a sense, I think it's essential. It, it will be difficult, partly because um, of the lack of data at the moment, but partly, as Richard has said, because AHPs work in a range of different settings and they are different professionals. Um, but if you think about the, the vision, the 2020 vision, for keeping people at home as long as possible, um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists can play a huge part in that, um, in assessing what people's needs are and helping to put in place the sorts of support that keep them at home, equally getting people at home safely after they've needed to be in hospital. 
they're the people often who can make a difference. It's why we're, we're focusing here as well, as you said, on the absolute numbers, also on the mix between the particular professions and the way they work together is so key. I think it's, um, you're right, it's complex, not least because the mix of people needed in different parts of Scotland will be different. What you can do in a city like Edinburgh is very different from what you can do in a remote part of the Highlands. But you do need to have both that local picture and build it up to the national picture to be able to plan the number of people going through training um, and give yourself a fighting chance of having the right staff in place to deliver health and social care quite differently in future. Thank you. Okay.